us along quickly. Um, her full bio is in your, in your packet. You don't need me to tell you about that, but I did want to kind of tee up her task today by putting it in the context of what we have been doing. Uh, as you know, yesterday at the town hall panel that was so ably led by Paul Steiger, I'll, I'll, those of us in the business media uh, had to wrestle with some pretty uncomfortable questions about how well did we do our job in the decade that led up to the financial meltdown of last year. Could we have done more? Could we have done it better? Could we have been more persuasive or more urgent in the stories that we did do? Um, how did we do? Uh, now that's an experience to which our keynote speaker can say, been there, done that. In normal times, I would probably uh, spotlight her as the first woman to lead the SEC in its nearly 75 year history. Um, Mary Shapiro started making her mark in the world of market regulation when the distance between the Wall Street executive suites and the nearest ladies room could be measured in decades, not feet. Um, but these are not normal times, so uh, the changes that we've seen in Wall Street diversity pale next to the changes that we've experienced in the nation's regulatory climate. Uh, those have shaped her career um, and that now must dominate our focus. These changes uh, now confront the SEC with what is possibly the greatest challenge to its relevance and its reputation since the days of World War II when it was literally exiled to Philadelphia to make more room in Washington for the defense apparatus. Mistakes were made, as they say in Washington. Changes are essential, as they now say in Washington. And one of the people who must remedy the mistakes and guide the changes is our keynote speaker today. Please welcome Mary Shapiro, Chairwoman of the Securities Exchange Commission. Thank you very much. And thank you, Diana, for that very kind introduction. When um, I've given very few speeches in my um, three months today, um, since I've been at the Securities and Exchange Commission. But when Diana called and asked me if I would do this, I really couldn't say no. We, uh, we share a real passion for a very specific kind of issue in the financial markets, and that is the protection and the education of our military when it comes to financial products and financial services. And Diana's done great work in that area um, and really inspired us um, back at NASD to get deeply involved in that issue. So um, I couldn't possibly have said no to her. But it's also an honor for me to be here with so many of you and many old friends um, because we actually share the same goal. We all strive to achieve an informed citizenry. Through your reporting and writing, you help make Americans smarter and wiser, not just about business in general, but about the financial markets in particular and that makes our job at the Securities and Exchange Commission easier. For me and for the SEC, it is all about investors. The more high quality, honest information investors have, the better off they are. And since becoming chairman just a few months ago, my focus has been on revitalizing the one agency whose primary responsibility it is to protect investors. Now, as many of you know, the SEC grew out of a very tumultuous time in our financial history. Following the great crash of 1929, Congress passed two significant pieces of legislation whose goals were clear, protect investors and restore investor confidence. It was actually 75 years ago this very day that the House Committee reported out the bill that created our agency. That committee report from April 27, 1934, references the words of President Roosevelt himself. At the time, the President was concerned with what he called naked speculation or investments with significant risk. He said, such speculation has been made far too alluring and far too easy for those who could and for those who could not afford to gamble. And he talked about his concern that workers were risking their paychecks or their meager savings on transactions that they barely understood, or in his words, with whose true value they were wholly unfamiliar. And that is why President Roosevelt urged the passage of the legislation. Legislation, he said, was for the protection of investors, for the safeguarding of values, and so far as it may be possible, for the elimination of unnecessary, unwise, and destructive speculation. 
A few weeks later, the Exchange Act of 1934 passed and the SEC was born. And it wasn't long before one of the early chairmen declared the agency the investor's advocate. And for 75 years, the agency has largely been known by that moniker, but not unfailingly. And that is part of what I want to talk to you about today. It is perhaps stating the obvious to note that given the current state of our economy, the value of our pensions and 401ks, our aging demographic, and the complexity of financial transactions, that there has never been a time when investors have needed a strong advocate more than they do today. They understandably lack confidence in the markets as vehicles to support their financial security. The SEC must play a central role in restoring that confidence for a simple reason. Until investors believe that they are not powerless pawns in the financial markets, until they believe in the basic integrity of financial markets, they will put their money in mattresses rather than mutual funds and in bread boxes rather than bonds. And that only serves to further undermine our economy. All of you in this room understand investments fuel our economic growth. They help the factory down the road hire more workers. They make it possible for a recent college graduate to start up a small business. They enable manufacturers to innovate. And they allow municipalities to build roads and bridges and hospitals. How we got to where we are today is a question that many will debate, especially in this room, for many years to come. But it is clear to me that the responsibility lies with many. From the institutions that cobbled together and aggressively sold risky financial instruments, to rating agencies that allowed the integrity of the ratings to take a backseat to their business interests, to mortgage originators who made complex loans to those who could not afford them, to regulators that didn't fully embrace the need for regulation or didn't appreciate the significant risks building throughout the entire system, or in the case of the SEC, simply didn't hew faithfully to the mission of investor protection, whether because of a lack of resources or because of philosophy. As a result, there is very significant debate going on in Washington, and I suspect in other cities around the country, not about whether regulatory reform should happen, but about what form it should take. Now, you might say the train has left the station, but no one is quite sure where it will come to a stop. Whatever form it takes, I support the view that there is a need for system-wide consideration of risks to the financial system and to create mechanisms to reduce and avert such systemic risks. But at the same time, I believe that any reform must not and cannot compromise the quality of our capital markets or the protection of investors. If we cannot show investors that we are looking out for their interests, as much as the interests of the financial institutions, then we will have very little success in restoring investor confidence. Investors need to see that we are going after those who engage in wrongdoing. They need to see that we are forcing companies to be truthful and transparent in their reporting. They need to see that we are limiting risk in areas where substantial risk is not what they're buying. And they need to see that we're rooting out fraud. In short, they need to see an agency that's there for them and primarily for them. They need an independent agency that exists not just to protect Wall Street, but to protect Main Street. By offering that to investors, we can help to restore confidence. Now, when Congress created the SEC, they understood not only that this new agency would be protecting investors, but that it would be advocating for individuals who were disparate in their views and not cohesive in force. So Congress ensured we were an independent regulator, one that could champion those who otherwise did not have a voice, a regulator that was not afraid to take on the most powerful interests in the land. Our job is to promote efficiency, competition, and fairness around each and every dollar invested. We do this by regulating the exchanges and clearing agencies that make our markets work. We do this by helping to reduce transaction times to a nanosecond and by reducing the cost of trades to just pennies. We do this by fostering information that is accurate, meaningful, and timely through thousands of disclosure reviews each year.